In this video, you're going to learn how to work with linear programming problems. So let's dive in. The first thing you want to know is how to work with the constraints, the feasible region, and your objective function, what you're trying to minimize or maximize. So just a bird's eye view, what you're trying to do is you're trying to graph these linear inequalities and what you get is an overlapping region that satisfies all those constraints or those inequalities. And this red region here, I'm just showing you an example, this would represent what's called our feasible region. And if you pick any point in that region, it satisfies the constraints. But what's interesting is that at the vertices, at these points on this polygon that's formed here, will give you either a maximum value or a minimum value, depending on what you're trying to uh, find. So let's go ahead and do a basic example first where we're trying to minimize, and then we're gonna do a word problem where we're gonna try to maximize. Okay, so for number one, our objective function is this z equals 2x plus 3y. And what we wanna do is we wanna minimize z. We wanna find the smallest value for z. Now the constraints, this is, these are our restrictions, or these are our inequalities, we wanna to graph to get our feasible region. So x is greater than or equal to zero, that's a vertical line, and greater than we're gonna be shading to the right. y is greater than or equal to zero, y equals lines are horizontal lines, and that's gonna be greater than, that's gonna be above. So what that does is that puts us in the first quadrant. We've got two more, we've got three x plus six y is greater than or equal to 24. What I'm gonna do for this one is I'm just gonna make a table and find the x and y intercepts. So if x is zero, three times zero is zero, so I'm just gonna cover that up, divide both sides by six, so you can see that y is gonna equal four. And then if I set y to zero, zero times six is zero, and if I divide by three to both sides, x is gonna equal eight. So that's just a quick way, this is called the intercept method of graphing inequality. So we've got zero, four, one, two, three, four, that's gonna put us right here and eight zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight zero. And I'm just gonna draw a solid line because it's equal to. And then when you graph using the x and y intercepts like this, you wanna pick a point on either side of this line and test it to see if it makes it true. So for example, if I put zero, zero in, that's the origin, this is test point here, is zero greater than or equal to 24? Well, no, so that means we wouldn't want to shade on this side of the line, we want to shade on this side of the line. So let me go ahead and just draw some lines just so we know that we're on this side. Okay, for the second inequality, y is greater than or equal to negative three x plus nine. So we see that the y-intercept is nine, so that's gonna be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. The slope is negative three, which is like negative three over one, so we're gonna go down three over one, down three over one, um, et cetera. So let me just kind of draw this in. Okay, something like that. And this one, y is by itself, and when y is greater than, that means that we're gonna be shading above the line. So what that means is I'm gonna be shading uh, on this side of the line. So let me just draw some lines just to illustrate some shading here. Okay, like that. Now, you can see that we were above the x-axis, we were to the right of the y-axis, we're above this line, and we're above this line. So what happens here is that where do all these regions overlap? Well, they're overlapping right here, 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 and like this. So basically, if I kind of go back and shade this a little bit darker here, it's gonna put us in this region here. Now this is what's referred to as an unbounded region because you can see it keeps going like this, keeps going over like that, and so you know, continues forever and ever. But what we're gonna do now is we're gonna pick the uh, points, these vertices along this region here. So we're gonna take this point here, which was the point, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, so zero, nine. We're gonna take this point here, which we're gonna solve for in a minute, and then we're gonna take this point here, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, comma, zero. Now, how do we find this point here? This is probably the toughest part of the problem. Well, remember, this is this line, and this is this line, and we're trying to find where they intersect. So that's these two lines here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna treat them like equations, not inequalities now. We're just gonna treat them like lines. We wanna find the intersection point. And I think the easiest way to do this one is to use substitution. So if y is equal to negative three x plus nine, let's put that in place of y here in this equation. So we get three x plus six times negative three x plus nine is equal to 24. So let's go ahead and solve this, distribute. That gives us negative 18x plus 54. 
bring down the 3x, this comes out to negative 15x. Subtract the 54, that's negative 30, and divide both sides by negative 15, and x is equal to 2. Now if we take 2 and we put it back in here, you get negative 3 times 2 is negative 6, plus 9 is 3, so you can see y is equal to 3, and that's the coordinates of this point right here, 2 comma 3. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take these vertices, put them into our objective function, and see which one gives us the minimum value, the smallest value. So let's go ahead and put 0 in for x, 9 in for y, so that's going to be 2 times 0, which is 0, 3 times 9 is 27, 0 plus 27 is 27. So for this point we get a value of 27. Let's put in 2 and 3, so 2 for x, 2 times 2 is 4, 3 times 3 is 9, 4 plus 9 is 13. Okay, at that point, and then if we pick 8, 0, 2 times 8 is 16, 3 times 0 is 0, 16 plus 0 is 16. So which one gave us the minimum value? It looks like this one right here, 13. So to minimize, uh, you would want there to be 2 of whatever the x quantity is, 3 of whatever the y quantity is, and that's going to give you a minimum value of 13. So let's go ahead and dive into a word problem now where we're going to maximize the profit. Before we dive into this word problem, if you're new to the channel and we haven't met yet, my name is Mario of Mario's Math Tutoring, and my goal for this channel is to make learning math less stressful so that you can raise your grade, pass your class, and go on to pursue your dreams. So I'm a full-time math tutor. I work with students every day, and what I do is I try to find the simplest and easiest and most understandable way to do some of these problems, and I take it and try to condense it down and put it into these videos so that you can benefit uh, from, from my tutoring as well. So if that's something you're interested in, check out more videos on my uh, Mario's Math Tutoring YouTube channel. But let's dive into number two. A company produces two bikes, a mountain bike and a road bike, it takes three hours to assemble a mountain bike and takes four hours to assemble a road bike. The total time available to assemble bikes is 60 hours. The company wants to have at least twice as many mountain bikes as road bikes to sell. The company makes a profit of $200 per road bike and $100 per mountain bike. How many of each bike should be made to maximize the profit? So that's kind of a, a lot of uh, words there. And usually what I recommend when you're doing these story problems is just kind of read through it real quickly. You don't have to get everything the first time. And then usually what you want to focus on on these optimization, these linear programming pro problems, is, is the last sentence. That'll usually tell you the story as far as what you're looking to, to maximize or minimize, and it'll also tell you what your variables are. So let's do that. So it says, how many of each bike should be made to maximize the profit? So we know we're trying to maximize profit, and we're trying to figure out how many road bikes and how many mountain bikes. So why don't we call the mountain bikes uh, X, and we're going to call the road bikes Y. Okay, so on our graph here, I'm just going to say X is mountain bikes, and Y over here is going to be the road bikes. Okay, so now let's look at uh, what are called the constraints. These are our restrictions, our limitations. See how it says it takes three hours to assemble a mountain bike and four hours to assemble a road bike, but you only have 60 hours available. So can you work more than 60 hours? No, it has to be less than or equal to 60. So we've got three hours to assemble a mountain bike. We have four hours to assemble a road bike, but the amount of time spent assembling has to be less than or equal to 60 hours. Now notice, like say if you assembled like four mountain bikes, well four times three hours per mountain bike, that's 12 hours assembling mountain bikes, right? Or if you did five road bikes, five times four hours to assemble one road bike, that's 20 hours spent and you want to make sure that total is less than or equal to 60. Now, what other constraints are there? Well, we know that you can't assemble like a negative number of bikes, right? So right off the bat, we know that uh, X has to be um, uh, greater than or equal to zero, the number of mountain bikes, and the number of road bikes also has to be greater than or equal to zero. So what that does is it puts us you know, in uh, this first quadrant, because x is greater than or equal to zero, y is greater than or equal to zero, those are going to overlap in the first quadrant. But we also have one more constraint here. It says the company wants to have at least twice as many mountain bikes as road bikes to sell, right? So they want to have at least twice as many mountain bikes. So the number of mountain bikes, x, has to be at least, that's greater than or equal to, twice as many uh, road bikes. Okay, so maybe mountain bikes are more popular, right? But what's interesting about this inequality is see how we have x by itself? We could rearrange this to get y by itself, but we'll do that in a minute. The first thing we want to do, though, is we want to look at 
a couple different ways to graph these. Like you see how this one's kind of like in the standard form. See how the variables are on the left, numbers on the right. Usually when it's in this form, I like to use the intercept method. I set X to zero and I solve for Y and I set Y to zero and I solve for X. You don't have to do that. If you want, you can rearrange the equation and solve for Y and put it into Y equals MX plus B form. A lot of students prefer that method, but let's try and do the intercept method for this inequality. So if X is zero, three times zero is zero. I'm gonna cover that up since it's nothing. Divide both sides by four, that means that Y is 15. If y is zero, four times zero is zero, that's nothing, cover that up. Divide by three, you can see x is gonna be 20 when y is zero. So let's plot those points. So zero, 15, that's right there. 20, zero, that's gonna be right there. We're gonna draw a solid line since this is equal to, right? And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a test point. I'm gonna pick the origin zero, zero. If I put zero in for x and y, that makes this zero. Is zero less than or equal to 60? Yes, yeah, so that means where this test point is, that, that's true, so you wanna shade on that side of the, the line. And remember, we were in the first quadrant because of these two constraints. For the last one though, you see how this is x is greater than or equal to two y? Let's get y by itself. So we're gonna divide both sides by two, and so that gives you uh, one half x is greater than or equal to y, and then I'm gonna flip this whole inequality so it's actually y is less than or equal to one half x. So let's go ahead and graph this one now. Uh, the y-intercept is zero, the slope is one half, so I'm going up one over two. Now, see really I went up five over 10, but because the scale on the x and y-axis is the same, you can think of it as just going up one unit over two, two steps. And then let's repeat that, so up one over two, we put you right about there. And this one is also equal to, so it's gonna be a solid line, like this, right? Uh, but y is less than, now when you have the y by itself, okay, on one side of the inequality, if, if y is less than, y controls the up and down, right? So less than means we're shading below this line. If you want, you can do a test point. You can pick a point over here, see if it makes the inequality true. If it's false, you shade the other side. If it's true, you would shade where that test point is. So that means we're gonna be shading below this line, right? Now you can see where are they overlapping? We're below this line, we're below this line, we're above the x-axis, we're to the right of the y-axis. It's gonna be right in this region right here. It kind of forms like a triangular region. The main thing that we're interested in are now are the vertices of that feasible region, okay, that polygon that's formed, right? So we know this point, that's easy, zero, zero. We know this point, that's easy, that's 20 comma zero. But how do we find this point? That's probably the toughest part about the problem, right? Well, it looks like this is the intersection of these two lines, uh, y equals one half x, we're just gonna treat it like an equation, and this one here, three x plus four y equals 60. I think the easiest thing to do is to do a substitution. So if y equals one half x, I'm gonna put one half x here. So that comes out to three x plus four times one half x, because we're putting one half x in for y, equals 60. We're just treating it like an equation. Four times one half is two x, plus three x, that's five x, divide by five, you can see x is coming out to 12. If we put 12 back in here, or here, it doesn't matter, either one, one half times 12 is six, so our y value equals six, so this point is really right here at 12 comma six. Now all we have to do is test which one of these points is gonna give us the maximum profit, because that's what we're trying to maximize. Now, we didn't write the formula for the profit equation yet, so let's do that. Profit equals, uh, you make $100 per mountain bike, so it's 100 times X, and you make $200 um, for each road bike, so that's gonna be plus 200Y. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take each point uh, you know, on the vertices of this feasible region, and we're gonna plug it into our profit equation. Of course, if you sell zero mountain bikes and zero road bikes, 100 times zero, 200 times zero, that's a profit of zero, okay? If we do this point over here, 20 mountain bikes and zero road bikes, that's gonna be 20 times 100 is 2,000 plus zero, so this is gonna give us a profit of 2,000, and if we do 12 uh, comma six, if we put 12 in for X and six in for Y, that gives us 1,200 plus six times 200 is also 1,200, so this is giving us a profit here of 2,400, and so which one was the greatest since we were trying to maximize profit? Well, 2,400 is larger than 2,000, larger than zero. So this is gonna maximize our profit if we make 12 mountain bikes 
and six road bikes that will satisfy the constraints or the restrictions, but still you know, keep the profit at a, at a maximum. So if you wanna see another example, I, I did another video on uh, linear programming. Follow me over to that video right there, and I'll show you how to work with that one.